nanohub.org. Okay, let's move on to the concept of guarding as it relates to an AC impedance meter or to a CV measurement. Uh, you may remember in a DC measurement, we used what was called a driven guard to reduce the stray capacitance and leakage current in our systems. In an AC impedance measurement, we use what's called a low side guard or a grounded guard. Okay, The, the guarding is intended to reduce the effects of stray capacitance from impacting the measurement. Right? The guard terminal on an AC impedance measurement is the outside shield of the coax. Right? So let me contrast that to the DC guard we talked about yesterday. Remember on a DC instrument we had a triax cable. On a triax cable the center pin was signal, the inner shield was a driven guard, driven to a voltage to match the center pin, and the outer shield was the common or the low of, of the measurement. Well, CV or AC impedance is a coaxial based system where the center pin is the signal, the outer shield is the common or the reference or the return path or the guard. They all serve the same function. So here's some examples of guarding and I have some, some graphics to demonstrate this. When only one parameter between two terminals of a multi-terminal device is being measured, the unused terminals should be guarded. You should put them in a place where you know where they're at. Don't let them float. If you're using a chuck in your system, you need to be aware. Now we do, everything we do is on a wafer chuck. Wafer chucks have a lot of stray capacitance and a lot of load. So you need to be aware of where the chuck is at. Sometimes we'll tie the guard to the chuck. So here's an example of guarding on a bipolar transistor. Right? So our CV has a high cur, high pot, remember that's force and sense from the high side, has a low cur and low pot, that's force and sense on the low side. Remember that our AC si signal typically comes out of the high cur and our AC signal is typically measured on the low cur. Our ammeter is on the low cur. What we're trying to do is measure capacitance from base to emitter. That's what we want to know is the, the capacitance from base to emitter. But if we just hook this CV meter up here on the base and the low terminal on the emitter, what we're actually going to get is the base to collector and collector to emitter capacitance in parallel with that. And this is actually what we're going to, what we're going to measure. So the truth is, I really cannot deconvolve the base to emitter capacitance from one measurement here. Right? I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, uh, notice that I ran source and sense out here and tied the shields together. Right? Oh, that was the thing I stopped to think about before. We were talking about cable length and how cable length changes the measurement. Cable length is only valid to the Kelvin point. So when I do cable length, what I'm saying is I'm compensating the cable length around that loop. I, I see people all the time, particularly in switch matrices, where they will Kelvin the high current and high pot together, either at the instrument or at some point along the way, and then they run a fairly long cable from this Kelvin point out to the sample. This cable from the Kelvin point to the sample, I have absolutely no way of knowing anything about the phase shift in that. I have absolutely no way of compensating for it. Now my open and short will compensate for the residuals of that cable, but there's no way to compensate the phase shift of that cable. So on a four wire LCZ or AC impedance style meter, your best bet is to run your Kelvin point as close as you can to the actual device. Question. Sometimes we have an option or we're told to have multiple shorts of the device. Which we can't provide us part of that. So, in case of a light tight enclosure, we might have a shorting of the guards at the pass through in the wall of the chamber, and another one very close to the measurement, actually, uh, at, very close to the tips or the probes. What happens in that case? Okay, that, that's a very good question, and that also relates to the question you asked earlier. So let me rephrase the question for the, for the microphone. So basically you're saying, um, 
what we're showing here is shorting the shields together as close as we can to the probe tips, right? But because of, of the way that our probe system is set up, we may wind up shorting at some intermediate point here, maybe when we go through the wall of the shielded enclosure. Um, a corollary to that also was, what if my shield is actually tied to earth ground. In other words, what if I've earth grounded the enclosure of my chamber and then I've shorted these shields to that earth ground? Was that your question also? Okay. And the answer is this. Um, the closest point to the device is the point that counts. So if you have intermediate shorts in here, these shorts will override that. They're shorter than those shorts and they will, they will make the measurement work correctly. Okay. So if you short at the feed through back here and you also short here, it doesn't matter that you're shorted at the feed through. But if you short at the feed through here, but don't short it here, all this residual distance which is what we call the inductive loop, is not compensated for. So the larger your inductive loop, the bigger the error is, and the higher you go in test frequency, the bigger your error is. Okay, so that inductive loop impacts you in that way. The other, the corollary to this question was, what if I actually have shorted this to earth ground somewhere, the concept being, boy, my earth ground runs off and goes through the wall and goes through other instruments and eventually winds up back at the instrument. The answer is that doesn't matter, right? The instrument is, is insensitive to the fact that you shorted this to earth ground here. Now, I have seen the case where somebody did not short anything, any of these grounds together and had it shorted to earth ground. And that actually made the measurement worse because now our return path actually had to go through earth ground, through the power line, back through some other instrument, through the power cord, through the power supply of the instrument, and eventually get back to the CV meter. So it actually created a huge, I mean, it created a ground loop the size of the room. <laughs> okay. And uh, so ground loop, by the way, it does include the area that you're enclosing. So. So those are both very good questions. Shorting the shields together is incredibly important and it becomes more important as you go higher in frequency. You can actually get away with it at 100 kilohertz and down. And eh, you know, these inductive ground loops at, a, at, at those long wavelengths are not a problem really, right? But at, at certainly at a megahertz, you want to consider doing this and above megahertz, it's a big deal. So getting back to guarding. How do I guard? Remember that my guard is the outer shield. So basically I have to grab this outer shield and run it over here to my collector terminal. And here's what's actually happening here. Remember I'm sourcing AC voltage out here and trying to drive AC voltage through this junction and through this junction. That AC voltage comes back here as an AC current that I measure that current. Well that AC current is still flowing here, but now I've taken this point and I've grounded it. Okay, and so the AC current actually flows back here and is never measured. That's called a low side guard. Now you remember we discussed the auto balance bridge before. The purpose of the auto balance bridge was to take this point, which is actually the Kelvin point, and drive it to virtual ground. So if this point is at virtual ground, this current is going to want to sneak back here. This current is going to come back to this virtual ground, which by definition is the shield of the coax cable. Does that make sense? So if I've got this point at virtual ground, I'm going to have no current flowing through this capacitance here. If I got no current flowing through it, neither one of those is in my measurement and now I'm just measuring the base to emitter capacitance. So guarding on an AC impedance meter is grabbing the shell. You can grab any one of these shells that you want. You know, these shells are all tied together back here. Grab the shell anywhere and connect it out here to the collector. So now, those of you that actually have probed on a probe station will, will say, 
but Lee. I have a manipulator here with a coax connector on it, and I have a manipulator here with a coax connector on it, and I have one down here. How do I get the shell of this manipulator to the center pin of that coax connector? In other words, <laughs> how do I physically connect this thing up? Okay, I mean that has always been a problem with AC and penis measurements, and it's also a big problem with the ultra fast IV, which is our last session for today. And the answer is you need to cobble something together or you need to buy something that Keithley calls a Y cable. Keithley sells a special cable that's only about this long and it's a Y cable. This one will connect to the base. This one is actually still has a coax connector on it, but the coax connector is actually just connected to the center pin. It's connected to the shield of this cable. So you run that Y cable from this manipulator to this manipulator and, and that takes care of it for you. All right, it's about all the time I have allocated in this seminar to cover that. However, at the Keithley website, we have a uh, two seminars that cover that in detail. We got three seminars that cover this. One is our CV seminar, one is our ultra fast IV seminar, and we actually have a probe station seminar that also covers some of these cabling issues. One other point on the guard connection. I always, always have to chuckle at this one. So if you take a look at a traditional LCR meter, um, they put a banana jack on the front of the LCR meter and they call it guard, okay? So that banana jack is actually the shell of the, of the coax cable. So what they're implying is that you can take a banana plug and a piece of wire and run it from the banana jack over here to the collector and guard out the collector. You can't do that, okay? The inductive loop of that banana jack to here is gonna make this connection look like an extremely high impedance to a megahertz, okay? So it's pretty much, I mean, you know, it's nice to have a banana jack there because it's easy to connect to, but it's really only good at really low frequencies, say 10 kilohertz and down, all right? Here's uh, the example of this uh, bipolar transistor. Uh, when we were unguarded, this was 7.1 picofarads is what we measured as our base emitter junction. And when we guarded it, it went down to about 6.8 picofarads. So the residual parallel capacitance of the other two nodes were, were uh, several picofarads. <clears throat> We actually then went and did the same thing on a MOSFET, since MOSFETs are more prevalent. And you'll see that the gate to source capacitance on a MOSFET, this particular one was 2.4 picofarads, but when we guarded it, it was 1.7 picofarads. <clears throat> so let's talk about guarding measurements on a wafer. Keep track of time. <clears throat> So if you were to do a simple uh, model of a capacitance measurement on a wafer, you would have the capacitance meter here with its Kelvin cables, jumpered shields together, going through the probe down to the top pads, the two top pads on this, this wafer. So this is what we call a dual top side contact on this wafer, all right? Now that pad has some residual capacitance to the chuck, and that pad has some residual capacitance to the chuck. Now, you know, in many, many cases today where you, we're using 300 millimeter wafers or even 200 millimeter wafers, this chuck is a huge area that is usually going down to earth ground. And earth ground has some impedance back to the reference on this capacitance meter. So this chuck is looking like a huge capacitive shunt load, even though we're doing dual topside contacts. Right. So what we want to do, if possible, oh, I'm sorry, there's a question. Uh, the last time you showed, uh, the trucks we have here in our home stations, they're floating, they're isolated. They're not grounded unless we ground them on purpose. In such a situation, do we still have that straight capacitance you mentioned? Right. Let me, 
Let me repeat the question. So the, the, the comment was the chucks that we have here are commonly what are known as a floating or an isolated chuck unless we specifically ground it. And the answer is that's almost all chucks. Almost all chucks are floating chucks. But when they define a chuck as a floating chuck, they're defining that as floating from a DC perspective. So the resistance, the DC resistance, is pretty high here. On a, on a good floating chuck, it might be tens or hundreds of mega ohms. So that's really not floating from a DC perspective compared to what an SMU can measure, because an SMU can be five or six or eight orders of magnitude higher impedance than that. But it is, it is, you know, 100 mega ohms is considered floating from a DC perspective. But there's hundreds and hundreds of picofarads of residual capacitance down to the chassis. There's simply no way to easily get rid of that. <clears throat> Most chucks have a, a lot of a complex impedance tying it down to ground. So even a floating chuck really isn't floating. Okay. So if you take your chuck and you physically tie it to ground, you've just bypassed all of those um, floating elements and you forced it down to wherever that chassis ground that you forced it down to is. All right. But what we're suggesting is if you take the outer shield of this and tie it to the chuck, then the chuck is now at the potential of this outer shield which is our guard potential. So now any current that flows through these residual elements to the chuck is actually shunted directly back to our virtual ground of our measurement system. So this is a really good way to, to get rid of that, those strays on the chuck. Now, as it turns out, in most cases, these residuals from the wafer to the chuck are small enough that we can ignore them. And in those cases, we can often let the chuck float. But I've seen cases where chucks can float up off of earth ground and it can create other potential problems. If you actually shorted the chuck, you'd be, you would be creating a path for these back to here. But these are usually small enough that we can deal with them. So in most cases, we don't need to bother trying to connect this shield to the chuck. But if you're discovering some anomalies in your measurement and you just can't understand why your measurements aren't fitting your model, maybe it's noisy or maybe it's not fitting the model, you need to be aware it could be residuals from your pads down to your chuck and this would be one way to get rid of it. Okay. Now I wanted to point out something. Most chucks actually have a coax or a triax cable or a pair of them that run from the chuck through the system back to the back panel of the probe station. This, I've, I've seen these cables be this long, okay? So if you short that cable, it's, it's a DC short, but it's certainly not a short at 10 megahertz. You've got this much cable with nothing but pure inductance in it. And you know, it's, it's quite a high impedance from a, uh, a AC impedance perspective. I've actually had to, in some instances, take a third manipulator and drop the needle right down on the chuck so I had a local place that I could tie the ground to the chuck with a third manipulator. Chucks are a huge problem to precision advanced measurements. The um, probe station companies have done a really good job of, of coming up with a way to guard the chucks and isolate them from a DC perspective. So they've dealt with the fact that we can get very low DC current measurements out of chucks now, but nobody has dealt with the fact that um, in any AC impedance or transient measurement, chucks are nothing but a huge burden that has never been dealt with by the probe station companies. So, you know, the simple trick I usually do, if I think I'm having a problem, I take a third manipulator, I drop the probe pin down on the chuck, and then I make my connections there. That gives me a local chuck connection, a way to locally control where the chuck is with respect to the rest of my measurement system. I've actually got up to about 100 megahertz doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, 75 to 100 megahertz. So. That third SMU that you mentioned, you, you put it at ground potential? 
In, in this particular case, I would actually take that Y cable I just talked about, I would run it from this manipulator over to another manipulator and drop this manipulator down on the chuck. And that would give me roughly this much distance of a ground loop down to the chuck. And in that much distance, actually that much distance, I, could, I should be able to get 150 megahertz bandwidth out of that. But because of other factors, it was down at about 75 megahertz bandwidth. We actually measured it with a VNA, <laughs> measured the bandwidth. So, But remember, bandwidth is defined on a 3 dB point. 3 dB is a half power thing. A half power thing is good when you're doing RF measurements, but it's not good when you're doing CV measurements. CV measurements, we're trying to do things to 1%, not 50%. Okay, so you know the 3 dB bandwidth doesn't always give you a good picture of what you can do in CV. But when I got a 3 dB point of, of 75 or 80 megahertz, I was feeling a little more confident I could certainly get 1 or 5 or maybe even 10 megahertz CV through the system. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, there are cases where we have three terminal devices. In, in that case, for example, you, you're using two terminals to measure the capacitance and the third terminal is to control the value of that process, some kind of voltage control capacitance. Let's say I use a chuck okay. to put some voltage on the on the test thing, right. and that voltage on the chuck changes the capacitance. So I'm okay. using the high and low to measure the, the capacitance, but the chuck is actually controlling the value of that capacitance. Okay. So can you comment on that? What would be the effect of that and what would be the Okay, let me repeat the question for the camera. Um, we have a three terminal device where the, the two terminals are topside terminals, but the third terminal of our device is actually on the chuck. And what we need to do is we need to control the DC bias on the chuck, which is having an impact of what we're measuring up on our, on our device up here. Now, um, what I have to do so let me start by beginning, I'll start this way with the answer to that. First of all, with a traditional LCR meter, the DC bias comes out of here, out of the high Kerr terminal. With the Keithley AC impedance meter, we actually allow you to put DC bias on both terminals. So conceptually, depending on what the model is of your device, you could use these two DC biases to control the electric fields here and here. Because you have full control of DC bias on both terminals, you could bring the chuck down to this guard potential and hold it there. You could elevate this some distance off the chuck, meaning your sample is now some DC distance off the chuck, and then you can make this some DC distance away from this. Uh, that in some cases, depending on the model you have, that might take care of the problem for you. So this is a unique capability that the Keithley AC impedance meter has, that it has DC bias available on both temp pins, giving me more control of where my electric fields are located. Okay, but let's assume in your model that won't work for whatever reason. So what we have to do then is we have to come up with a third DC bias that we put down here on the chuck. So what we would normally do is we would attach, since this instrument includes AC impedance meters and SMUs, we would attach an SMU down here. So now we've got an SMU probably attached through that big long triax cable and through another big long triax cable back to the SMU. All right, and so the SMU is providing me a DC bias here, but the AC path from that chuck through that cable, through that SMU, all right, is a pretty high impedance. Um, the cables themselves are going to be a fairly high impedance and SMUs are a fairly high impedance to an AC signal in general. Um, there, there are some bypass paths in uh, SMU is a complex device and so you know if you try to stuff a gigahertz into it it's going to respond differently than 10 megahertz and, a, and 1 megahertz. Okay, If you try to stuff 10 kilohertz in it, an SMU would actually respond to it. So in general using an SMU through those long cables this will be a high impedance pathway and it will look like a floating chuck. <laughs> 
probably the residual capacitances of this chuck will be a lower impedance path to ground back to this unit than the actual SMU itself. So uh, we have actually used uh, SMU to example bias up the drain of a MOSFET while we try to measure AC impedance from the, the gate to the substrate or the gate to the source and um, you know that it really kind of at a megahertz and above the drain looks like an AC floating terminal even though it's DC biased. So, so um, you know, if the, if the dual DC bias doesn't do it, maybe an AC um, uh, uh, SMU. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing you can do, and we sell an accessory to do this, we call it our CV power package. What the CV power package is, is really a set of bias T's, RF bias T's. A bias T is a, a device that has a, a low impedance AC path and a high impedance DC path. So if you actually tied a bias T to the chuck and then tied the SMU to it, you would be guaranteeing that the SMU was a high impedance path to the AC signal. So these bias T's are really, they're a, a wonderful accessory that gives you some flexibility when you're trying to do uh, uh, multiple things. Um, I think it's about a $2,000 option. You get a couple of bias T's. They actually allow you to go up to 400 volt differential on your CV measurements, which might be useful for some of the silicon carbide stuff that uh, some of you are working on here. Okay. So but I think in this case, I just don't put the car to the chuck. I just put the SMU in the back of the chuck. But right. We have some errors still due to the to the DC. You you may have some errors still. It all depends on the ratio of these to this and the ratio of this impedance to this impedance, mm -hmm. right? But if you ground this. Or if you tie it to the common here and then use these two biases to float everything up, this will be a non-factor. That will be out of the measurement. So that's one of the reasons we added this new capability to this AC impedance meter is it allows us to control the electric fields at both terminals. That's a great question. Thank you. You had another question? I think you just answered it. Okay. Uh, I was thinking if we apply a bias to the chart via the SNU, do we still ground it? Because uh, we have, so we can do this now, through the SMU. Right. Bias. Right. Uh, but I guess, uh, uh, as far as the CV measurement here is concerned, uh, that still needs to be configured. Right. So, from a DC perspective, the DC biases in this instrument are pretty close to the reference point of the DC biases in the SMUs. To relate it back to our training yesterday when we talked about the ground unit in the system. The ground unit in the system is DC coupled to the shell of this AC instrument. But it's not a good AC coupling. So you wouldn't want to use the ground unit as something that you're trying to return excuse me, the AC current through. But from a DC perspective, all the DC sources are pretty close to each other. There's a little additional settling time because of some RC time constants there. But in general, all the instruments exist at the same ground unit from a DC perspective. Now we decouple the uh, AC meter and the transient meter. So that's why we allow, and actually this is a first for any characterization system, we allow you to actually use both source measure units and AC impedance meters in one test setup. Now, uh, we warn you, you know, depending on what your device is, you might get some residual error because of the SMU, right? But in general, uh, you know, at, at the levels that we work at on semiconductor level testing, you can get away with that, particularly if you keep your frequencies at right at about a megahertz or so. So this particular slide actually talks about how you configure this instrument so you can have DC bias on both pins. And actually, what we actually allow is we actually allow you to set the high pin and the low pin to be whatever you want. So we, we actually designed and patented a very unique capability that no other LCR meter on the market has. And 
it really, once we were designing this instrument, it became obvious to us. Um, th there's a fundamental design concept in electronics that, that's called symmetry. In general, symmetry is a good thing in electronic circuits or on wafers or anything you do. Symmetry gives you balanced responses. And so we took that concept of symmetry and we applied it to the CV meter. And we said, let's not design a high terminal and a low terminal. Let's design both terminals to actually be functionally equivalent. Now, we went ahead and named them high and low because that's what people are used to dealing with in their different AC impedance meters. But the truth is, our high and low terminals are interchangeable. They're interchangeable from the fact that they have an AC drive, they're interchangeable from the fact they have a DC drive, and they're interchangeable from the fact they have an AC ammeter, and they're interchangeable from the fact they have an auto balance bridge. So really, our high terminal, which we've labeled here as CV high, has an AC source and an AC measure. The AC source is the AC source, the AC measure is our auto balance bridge, okay? And our low terminal also has an AC source and an AC measure. And our high terminal has a DC source and a DC common. And a DC, uh, low terminal has a DC source and a DC common. Actually, this slide's out of date. It's slightly inaccurate, but I'll correct it on the fly here. So in our advanced menu, you can come in here and say, well, I want my AC source to be on high and my AC measure to be on low. Or with a click of a button, I can flip them. So now I can have my AC source on the low and my AC measure on the high. So now, uh, it's, a, it's a common trick using LCR meters. When you hook it up backwards, it's noisy, and you have to go out there and switch the, uh, switch the you know, everybody knows about this, right? Well, you can do it in software now, okay? Also, with my DC source, I can flip my DC source. Well, the problem with flipping my old LCR meter was it flipped my DC source. Now I had to reverse all the polarities of my DC biases. Well, I can flip the AC source and then flip the DC bias programmatically. Now, um, with release 7.2, which was actually 18 months ago, we actually added a field to the common here that you can go in and actually turn on the DC bias on the opposite terminal. Hence, I give you control of the DC bias on both terminals. This is actually a really, really cool thing in semiconductor research because now you can envision, I now have the ability to put electric fields on multiple terminals and control those electric fields and measure the AC penance between those terminals. So now I have options for moving electric fields that I didn't have before. It's particularly neat for multi-terminal devices, three or more terminal devices. The, uh, the other thing it gives you, instead of just having a plus minus 30 volt DC bias, you got plus minus 30 volts on both sides. You tell one to go to minus 30, you tell the other one to go to plus 30, you now have a 60 volt span on this uh, instrument. Does that make sense? The symmetry between the high and the low terminals? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so on the table, on the DC power, yes. except for the low terminal, it's zero volts. Right. And uh, is that a common on the on the screenshot on the right side? If on the, excuse me, on the screenshot, uh, the, this one right here. Yes. Yes. So, so DC common, by definition, is zero volts. That's our zero volt point. But that's, that was the mistake I was trying to describe in the slide. This is an old slide. So actually now, our DC low, which, which is our D DC reference point, is no longer actually required to be at zero volts, and it's no longer required to be common. All right, the DC low terminal now can be programmed to whatever DC voltage I want it to be. And, and so uh, both the low terminal and the high terminal now become referenced to the shell of the coax. So the shell of the coax is the common reference point, right? So now I can take the DC common terminal, but I could drive it to minus 30 volts or something, and it would be 30 volts away from the shell of the coax cable, right? Now, the AC current measure, 
which is defined here by the current measure selector box. The AC current measure is by definition a virtual ground at the shell of the coax cable. So the AC current measure, because we want to have guarding capability, we require that the from an AC perspective, this terminal be at the shell. So from a DC perspective, I can float away from the shell, but from an AC perspective, the shell is my zero volt point, and my AC current measure terminal forces that point to be at the shell using the auto balance bridge. So I force a virtual ground there with an auto balance bridge. All right? That's what allows me to use guarding to guard out chucks and things like that. All right? Uh, we have a great tutorial on our website, which is called The Fundamentals of CV Semiconductor Testing, that goes into some of the details that I'm skipping here. So if you get a chance, that's about a 45-minute archived webinar online. So this is a new concept, this ability to control the DC biases and the AC biases and where we put everything, all right? and. Uh, people are just beginning to explore this now and to learn some of the neat things uh, that, that you can do with it. So there's some really neat things, um, I think, that are going to come out of this. So uh, what I would like to invite you and everybody who sees this archived webinar is, if you come up with some unique applications or some ideas and you're not sure if this works or doesn't work and you want to discuss it, please contact us at Keatley. We'd be happy to, to work through it with you. All right. So. Let's discuss that concept of connecting the CV meters to the right terminals. Um, we call it connecting the ammeter to the proper terminal. And this, this applies whether you're using DC ammeters or AC ammeters. Really on a CV meter, the low terminal is an AC ammeter. That's really what it is. <clears throat> so if you connect the high terminal to pad number two and the low terminal to pad number one, the low terminal, the AC ammeter, is more sensitive to shunt loading, defined here as C1, than the high terminal. This is just a low impedance AC source. It can drive as much capacitance as you throw down here, okay? But this is an AC ammeter, and the more shunt loading you put on it, the noisier it'll get, okay? <coughs> so, um, when you look at your DUT, when you lay out your test structures, if you're laying them out with a dual topside contact, you want to be a little bit aware of what is my residual capacitance down to the chuck. And what I want to do is I want to choose the pad that has the lowest residual capacitance and put the ammeter on that pad. Okay. This is a, a little better visualization of that. Maybe my device has pad number two here, which has some C2, which is a long ways from the chuck. And pad number one is this one, which has some C1, which is close to the chuck, making C1 big. Okay. And here's my dot between the two pads. So in this case, I really want to connect my ammeter, defined here as my low terminal, to pad number two because that's the highest isolation or lowest capacitance to the chuck. So here's an actual example of what happens if you connect it backwards. Okay, So this purple line here is when we have the AC ammeter connected to the chuck or to something that's close to the chuck electrically. All right. And this is the noise just from that shunt capacitance of the chuck. But if we reverse the leads, this is the result that we get. So you see we get a much better noise capability. Now, with the new Keithley LCR meter, you can, in essence, reverse the leads software-wise. You just go in and click the button, and now the AC ammeter and the AC source are, swip, are flipped. So it makes it very easy to go in and determine if you've got your, your uh, system hooked up properly. So even if you are really are not aware of the parasitics of your device, um, you know, you can flip it and try it and, and see real quick if it makes a difference. Um, 
Again, this is just describing um, how we used to do it with LCR meters. If we had it connected low cur and, and, and high cur here, and we had and it was noisy, we'd have to actually reverse the cables. But then that reverses the DC bias. So now all my DC biases are backwards. Okay. I, I can't tell you over the years how many hundreds of emails and phone calls I've received from people that were using either the Agilent or the Keithley old AC meter, the Model 590, um, which all had negative bias. If you look at the software for the Keithley 590 the simultaneous CV, if you said, I want you to make plus five volts gate voltage. But then if you look at the front panel of the instrument, it goes to minus five volts. <laughs> and you're going, how come the instrument says minus five and I told it in software to go to plus five? Well, because I assumed you hooked it up backwards because that's the proper way to hook it up. Hence, I had to invert the DC voltage in order to get the proper polarity because you asked me for gate voltage, but I'm actually applying the bias to the substrate. So, so this is the DC bias problem. It shows up all the time. I actually see it published in papers where people get this wrong. So, but with the new Keithley meter, we actually um, uh, take care of this. Now, for those of you that saw the seminar yesterday, we talked about the user interface. I'm skipping user interface stuff today, but I wanted to point out with the AC meter, our user interface automatically gives you an indication of the polarity of the DC bias. So if you connect my meter from gate to bulk, which in my user interface would be labeled G and B, it will, it will report DC voltage GB. So it will tell you the polarity of the voltage that I'm giving you is from gate to bulk. If you go in my software and programmatically flip it, I will flip the name of the vector automatically and say DCV BG. I will tell you the polarities from bulk to gate. So in my user interface, I take into account all of this. But you need to be aware of what the BGGBs stand for in that case. They're referencing the name of the terminal that you're connected to. So remember on our, if we're doing just a capacitor, we call it cathode and anode. So it would be DC voltage CA from cathode to anode. All right. Um, so that's, a, a, that's how we take care of the DC bias issue. We've already talked about this jumpering the shields. Uh, you want to jumper them as close as you can gather, get together at the probe tips. We actually don't have enough time today to talk about all the intricacies of cabling. But Keithley has developed a new set of cables that we call the multi-measurement performance cables, the MMPC cables. These cables were specifically designed to take into account all the problems of jumpering shields together versus jumpering guards together versus having Kelvin connections versus having non-Kelvin connections. There are a couple of very good white papers on the Keithley website talking about the multi-measurement performance cables. And uh, if you if you really want to get into some details about cabling, and if you really want to cable your probe station properly, you want to take a look at the multi-measurement performance cables. Cabling problems are huge. Cabling problems are the single biggest problem in AC impedance measurements. Improper cable links give us phase shift errors. The length compensation uh, is supposed to adjust for the cable length, but if the cables are not the same as the length compensation or if source and sense are different length, we can't compensate for it and it'll, you'll have an error. Improper impedance. Actually turns out this is usually not an issue. Uh, LCR meters are 50 ohm cables. Keithley specifically designed our meter to be 100 ohm cables for a variety of reasons. Um, but if you were to put a 50 ohm cable on, on uh, the Keithley instrument, it actually doesn't really impact it. Um, up to say a megahertz or so. But remember that this meter, the Keithley meter can go up to 10 megahertz and now impedance will become more of a uh, an issue. Improper shield connections, they're not connected close enough to the device. Um, bent, crimped, or flattened cables. 
Coax cables have a physical size, a physical dimension that defines their properties. I see coax cables get slammed indoors and crimped and bent and, you know, when you change the physical dimension of a coax cable, you will change its impedance characteristics, right? Uh, one problem that we see frequently, we have gone to a SMA style connector for a variety of reasons. SMA connectors have to be properly torqued. Now, in general, on a CV meter, if you just screw the SMA connector on and get it finger tight, that's okay. But what happens is occasionally SMA connectors will get a little burr in them and your fingers can't overcome that burr. So we supply a, a calibrated torque wrench <clears throat> with the Keithley instrument and we recommend just a quick torque on the SMA connectors and that'll guarantee that you've, your connector is not giving you a measurement issue. <clears throat>